Hope family and friends. So good to see you all that are here before a holiday weekend. So uh, may God bless your sacrifice if it is one. That one didn't work. In addition to welcoming you here, I just have a few brief announcements about our service today and also about our facilities if this is your first time here. Uh, our restroom location is out the double clear doors that you came into. You go to your right and then you'll make another right. And then those where the closest restrooms are. If you would like to enjoy our newly renovated restrooms and they are going to be on the side of the administrative building just outside our cross courtyard so you should be able to find those uh, expeditiously if you need them please make sure you refer to our e-newsletter i don't know how many of you actually saw the one coming that was sent out this week, but it is a beautiful flyer. And it is a flyer that is giving us the pre-announcement of coming into Pentecost. So I hope you take an opportunity to look at our flyer and see what's coming up for the next week, as well as the introduction to our theme, which is freed up to live the Easter life. Our community voice today is coming from our very own Dr. Bettina Shea. That's my sister from another mister. <laughs> and we also want to give a very warm and heartfelt welcome to our very own Reverend Ivan Pitts, who is the <laughs> pastor, senior pastor at Second Baptist Church. Church in Santa Ana. Our prayers have been answered for him and he is here to bless us once again. And last but surely not least, our Jones family will be responsible for our, for our scramble board today. As you know, we do the scramble board right before we have, as we're having our passing of the peace. So at that time, the Jones family will come up and they will unscramble our phrase for this week. Now I'd like to welcome Mr. Dave Willett. Gonna need you on your feet, y'all. Please rise for the call to worship. So after each statement that I share, you can say, come Lord Jesus, set us free. Comfort us in our time of need. Come Lord Jesus, set us free. Help us to keep fighting for justice. Come Lord Jesus, set us free. Turn our anger into advocacy and our despair into faith. 
Come, Lord Jesus, set us free. We stand in prayer. Evil will not win. Come, Lord Jesus, set our free. We offer ourselves as living witnesses to worship like we mean it and praise like we know it. Come, Lord Jesus, set us free. Please stay standing for our next song. remain standing. Sorry. Uh, so we can pray together. 
Dear God, in your worthiness, we call out to you, God. We know that you receive us in our pain and love us through the brokenness that the world experiences. We confess dismay, anger, and disbelief over lives lost because of racism and gun violence. The sins of the world are too much to bear, and we need you to turn anger into a pursuit of justice. Turn our swords of resentment into plowshares of peace. Help us to stand on the side of righteousness that continues to seek freedom for the oppressed and hope for the heavy laden. Free us up to courageously seek your face and stand on your will in this time of despair. You may now go into your private closet and spend time with God. You may be seated. Friends, hear this good news and see the grace of God. Thanks be to God, we are heard, received, forgiven, and freed up to live and give of ourselves with new hope and new faith that comes from God through Jesus Christ. God loved the world so much that God gave us Jesus who came to take our sins away. I don't know about you, but this is reassurance and affirmation that restores the soul and gives us all the more reason to hold on and stand in solidarity with the people of God. God is giving us strength and hope to share. As we prepare to pass the peace of Christ, we invite the Jones family up to the scramble board. And as we do every week, return to your seat when the music is finished. So let's pass the peace of Christ together. Well, hello, New Hope family and friends, and good evening, Reverend Pitts. Um, most of you know, my name is Bettina Shea. I'm currently a ruling elder at New Hope. I sing sometimes, and I'm a member of the social justice ministry team. Uh, for those of you that don't know me outside of church, uh, I'm the incoming chair of the Department of Teacher Education at California State Long Beach. And most importantly, probably, I'm a wife, mother, sister, and auntie. 
So this week, Pastor Chinetta called me from South Carolina to ask if I would give the community voice. And she was, Rashawn knows how I feel. We are sisters from another mother because she got one of those calls too. And um, she said, you know, Bettina, would you share some thoughts um, adapted? I saw those posts you made on Facebook and they're really good. So, you know, it wouldn't it'd just be a couple minutes. You know, you could just adapt them and give the community voice. And you know when Pastor Tina calls from her vacation to ask if you will do something, even though she says to you, you know you can say no and I'll understand. <laughs> you answer the call of God and your dear sister and then you get up here and do the community voice. So here I am with you. So in his letter to the Romans, the Apostle Paul in chapter 12 verse 15 says, rejoice with those who rejoice mourn with those who mourn. My dear family, this week was a week where there was much mourning. And I know that many of you, like me, are here today with a heavy heart. And my heart shares your load. So I want to start my community voice by reading to you from a blog entry that I wrote on Wednesday, May 25th, a day after the shooting at Robb Elementary School in Uvalde, Texas, during which 19 children and two teachers were killed. This morning, I woke up crying. It is Asian American, Native Hawaiian, Pacific Islander Heritage Month, but most of this month, I have been grieving rather than celebrating. For the first part of this month, personal grief around mothering, and since then, particularly in the last 11 days, collective grief and renewed trauma based on my connections to multiple mass shootings. I was just feeling a little more like myself yesterday after spending over a week recovering from the shootings that occurred at the Topps Market in Buffalo, New York, and at Irvine Taiwanese Presby Presbyterian Church, just 20 miles from my home. So I got on social media, and then I saw the news about the school shooting in Uvalde, Texas. A friend had texted me that there was another school shooting in Texas, and it looked bad. And it reminded me of the morning my brother texted me on the way to pick up my nephew from Sandy Hook School nine and a half years ago when I was trying to piece information together. I knew we would not know the true total of those killed until the next day, maybe the next week. I knew that the community would become just another place on a list of towns and cities known first and foremost because a horrible, deadly mass shooting had taken place there. And in Uvalde, like Sandy Hook, it would be particularly heartbreaking because it was children and educators killed. My son was in first grade when the shootings happened at his cousin's school. My daughter was not alive yet. In fact, because there are 9.25 years between them, she is in first grade now. The Monday after the Sandy Hook shootings, I sent my son to an elementary school. One that, at the time, was open in the front and the back of the school. I was sad and I was afraid. This morning, I woke up crying. I am sad and afraid. So little has changed. This morning, I walked my daughter to an elementary school. This morning, she ate Cheerios with the heart-shaped Cheerios interspersed with the regular round O's. It is hat day. So she wore the raspberry beret I brought from her. I, brought, I bought her in France and her Paris shirt, pink leggings, and a pink sweatshirt. I asked if I could snap a picture of her before we left the house for our walk to school. I told her I wanted a picture of her all pink outfit for hat day. But part of me wanted a picture of her, wanted to remember her breakfast, wanted to remember every detail in case something happened. Now I am home. In a few hours, I will drive across town to my son's school where I will help celebrate the eighth and 12th graders. A few hours after that, our family will see my daughter perform Arivong with her class and two other classes. I have two papers to revise. Both of them are on centering humanity in the midst of dehumanizing context. One of them focuses on mother scholaring. Tonight, we will have this beautiful panel of heart-centered Asian American educators. They are gifts as humans. I do heart work, all of it. 
I live a heart-centered life, and I am broken. My heart is broken. I have pieced it together so many times. I've tried to fill the cracks with gold. I've resisted in hard and soft ways with authentic joy and sorrow, with words and actions. But today, it is heavy, even in and with a community of grievers. Today, the weight of it is all too much. This morning, I woke up crying. I cried after my daughter walked in the gates of her school. I'm sure I will cry many more times before the day is done and on days to come, because that is part of my heart-centered life. Today, the only resistance I can engage in is giving grace and holding space to myself and others, for myself and others. Perhaps it is the most important form of resistance there is. I did not mention this in my original blog post, but that text I mentioned from my friend also made me think of another text that I received about three months ago as a part of a group of leaders from this church about another act of violence against our dear brother, Reverend Dr. Ivan Pitts. I remember the shock that I felt that day, and I remember how all there was to do was hold space and extend prayers to Reverend Pitts for his healing, to his family, and to his community at Second Baptist Church. So that mourning was really present, right? And we continue to mourn with those who mourn. But friends, if there was only mourning, we would not be freed up to continue loving. We would not be freed up in the new hope of something beyond mourning. We would not be freed up to praise God. Remember, the other half of the Apostle Paul's exhortation to us is that we must rejoice with those who rejoice, believing in the deliverance of Christ even as we weep and mourn in our brokenness. And Reverend Pitts joining us today is one reason for rejoicing. His healing and his faith in spite of the horrible and unjustified act of violence he endured at his own home is a cause for us to rejoice. Just as we wept and prayed, we rejoiced with his family and with our family in Christ at Second Baptist. And next week, we will have another cause to rejoice together in this community as we worship in our new sanctuary for the first time. It is our promised land that we have been hoping for and waiting for expectantly that we have been praying about for so many years. We rejoice with one another, and we rejoice as one family in Christ. It is not that rejoicing cancels out the pain of our mourning. Rather, that the Lord in his wisdom has created us to be able to hold both and to hold that there will be times of rejoicing again even in the midst of our sorrow. And we can come to a time of rejoicing by moving forward towards a world with greater justice, empathy, and understanding of one another. So I end with one last Facebook post which I created on behalf of our social justice ministry team just hours after the Uvalde shootings. Friends, we are devastated and we are exhausted. The New Hope Presbyterian Church social justice ministry is made up of parents and of educators, of people who hold humanity, particularly that of children, families, and educators in high regard. Yes, we urge you to pray to lift up the community in Uvalde, the families who lost their loved ones, most especially those grieving parents whose lives are shattered at the loss of their little ones. But we also ask you to act. As President Biden said, as a nation, we have to ask, when in God's name are we going to stand up to the gun lobby? First, we grieve this terrible loss. Then we must do something to prevent this continued cycle of violence. Friends, let us mourn together. Let us rejoice together. Let us act together, holding love and one another's humanity in the highest regard. Thank you.
Let's pray. Bless us with your word, Lord. Empower us. Help us to see ourselves in you. Remove all distractions. Give us open minds and hearts to hear you and follow you. For we seek to be changed, and we thank you for faith and inspiration. And it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Tonight's scripture comes to us from the book of John, chapter 13, verses 33 through 35. Listen for the word of the Lord. My children, I will be with you only a little longer. You will look for me, and just as I told the Jews, so I tell you now. Where I am going, you cannot come. So a new command I give you. Love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples, if you love one another. May God bless this reading of his holy word. Amen. Amen.
What's up, y'all? It is so good to be here. I um, I had some some words of greeting that I had typed in advance, and then when I walked in to this space, um, they didn't seem appropriate because they were so planned, and I didn't plan to be so overwhelmed. There was, there was only about 11 times that I had to keep from crying. Um, I forgot how much you all love me. And um, I forgot how much I love you. And it's not because I'm ignorant of your love, um, but my daughters both are in college and they leave and they're so happy to leave because they think they've grown. Uh, but my mama said grown folks pay all their bills. And, and, they, and they have their own address. That's what my mama said. But whenever they come home after being gone for a few months to school, whether it's Christmas or break or summer recess or whatever it may be, they always forget how good it feels to be home and to be cared for in a way that they just can't get cared for. And so if you allow me to have that kind of context uh, it's just it's a special way you all care for people. And I told you, and I've said this, Reggie knows, I said if I wasn't the pastor of the Second Baptist Church of Santa Ana and I was a free agent, I, I don't know how I could not be a part of this church. Uh, it's, just, it's, just that, it's just that powerful. And um, Dr. Goodjoin has been more than a friend. She's been a gift. Um, she has been a great supporter. And I am a better person because Reggie has allowed her to be in the midst of a lot of things. And one of those things that he allows her to be in the midst of, he probably couldn't stop her anyway, um, <laughs> is he's, a, he's allowed her to be my friend and I'm, and I'm better for that. I want to thank you all for your prayers. I want to thank you for your support, notes, text messages, emails, cards, and some of y'all sent checks. Amen. <laughs> I almost want to go back to the hospital. <laughs> hey man, the stab wounds are pretty profitable nowadays, right? Helps in, with inflation. I don't know. Uh, uh, hey, brother. Brother. <laughs> I'm just kidding. No, I'm not. I'm, I'm, I'm. But anyway, so, 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 so thank you. And so I, I can relate to, I know that um, um, Pastor Goodjoin is down in South Carolina caring for a mother. And um, that is no easy task to care for parents. What they say, uh, once an adult, twice a child. And so it is interesting as we, we traverse and journey in the same kind of realm as we just put my mother on Wednesday into a facility, her second facility in two weeks. The first facility we put her in, they said that her decline was greater than their ability to care for her. And so, I mean, y'all should have told me before we wrote the check, but, um, I don't know, anyway, I'd just be strange. So let me just say this, I'm gonna say this right now. Don't look at your watches, I'm gonna take my time. Uh, I, and, and my plan is to, and I leaned over, my plan is to be here with you all next week. The challenge is I'm doing a, uh, a retreat in Dana Point. It ends right around 4 o'clock, but you know, your folks don't let a brother leave right at 4 o'clock. So I'm a, my, my plan, my goal is to be here with you all. So now that I have spoken it, I know Chris is going to text me like, well, you on your way, and I'll be like, yeah. <laughs> I'm coming, but my goal is to be here to celebrate. So I, I heard that um, 
wherever God, someone told me, a preacher told me, wherever God is doing something, you should never be jealous. You should try to be close. Because when God is doing something, God has this incredibly bad aim. He doesn't know how to just to aim at what he's blessing. Everything in the vicinity gets blessed. I'm just trying to be in the vicinity. Because I, I just, right? There, there's a song that says, I'm just trying to get some drops to fall on me. Amen. I know y'all being blessed, so I'm just trying to get some of that. Amen. All right. So, so um, the scripture has been read, John chapter 13, verses 34 and 35 is what I will be focusing on. A new command, I give you love one another as I have loved you. So you must also love one another. And in verse 35, by this, everyone will know that you are my church attenders. that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. Let's pray. God, speak for your servants are listening. God, move, for we want to be in line with the wind of your spirit. God, bless, for we stand in the need of a blessing. God, will you forgive us? We allow us to walk in the power of knowing that your grace and mercy and love is ever ending. God, will you save someone today? And may we all be victims of the fact that your word shall not return void. As a matter of fact, oh God, feed us. We thank you for this spiritual food that we're about to receive for the nourishment of our whole selves. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. The Interdenominational Theological Center is the seminary in which uh, Pastor Good John and my Good Join and myself matriculated some years ago. We weren't there at the same time. I'm older than her, and um, but we had the same professor. There was a professor. He was about six foot three. His name was Dr. John Diamond. He taught systematic theology. The reputation that he was unsaved and he was just an academic and that no one wanted to really take his class, but he had a core requirement course, required course for the first semester of incoming students so you could not avoid it. <laughs> so I walk into his class on the first day. I didn't even know if I should be in seminary. Sure enough, didn't want a pastor. Hmm. And I sit down in the uh, seat, and you guys need to know something about a black seminary. In a black seminary, we look for any reason to preach and to praise and to shout. And he gets up, he comes in with his six foot three self, the big afro. I think he had a jerry curl. And <laughs> jerry curls were bad in the 80s, they show enough with bad in the 90s. Amen. <laughs> and he stands up with a deep voice and he says, to a bunch of black southerners, this is the word of God. And you can imagine, amen. It is a lamp unto our feet. Oh, yeah. It is a light unto our path. It gives hope. And, uh, and everybody's shouting, brothers are standing, yes, doc, yes, doc. And I'm looking around in my first class. I'm like, is this how it's going to be? And then he takes this Bible and he flings it across the room, crashes to the back of the wall. Of course, my good Pentecostal got up and said, you are Satan and ran out the class. <laughs> but his point, he threw it, he says, but the word of God means nothing if it doesn't live in our hearts and in our actions. I don't know what else he taught that semester, but for me, that was the most powerful lesson, that the word of God is not stuck in the pages of a printed book. They must rise off of the pages, the screen, or the tablet, and find residence in our hearts and in our minds, and find actions in our lives. 
And so I believe with all my heart when I think about how bad things are in this world, when I think about the fact, this is a fact, that crime is down overall, but violent crimes are up. Overall crime is down, violent crimes are up. Um, I think it was on May 15th, there had already been 197 mass shootings in this country this year. A mass shooting is defined by four or more people who have been impacted by the shooting. Last year, there were only about 150 mass shootings all here only. We have already surpassed that by more than 50 or nearly 50, and we haven't even gotten to the six month period yet. Two years ago, there were only about 50 mass shootings in the country. Crime is down, but violent crimes are up. We are more divided today than we have ever been. And the, div the divisiveness is coming from not just CNN and Fox, but it's coming from every legislative position on every level in every aspect of this country. It's coming uh, in the pulpit and it's coming uh, from the pews and it's coming in the parking lot and the grocery stores and we are addicted to fighting and being indifferent with one another. It is so bad that if you are found interacting with someone who has a position that is different from yours, then you become ostracized. So those who have been vaccinated can't hang with those who are the unvaccinated. Those who have voted Republican can't hang with a Democrat. Those who are from North Orange County can't rub elbows with those who are from South Orange County. We can't have those who are pro-choice can't interact with those who are um, pro-life. And just can I just, can I pause for a moment? I ain't, ain't nobody pro-abortion. Hey, what, what, what is that? I'm pro-abortion. Yeah, yeah. I'm pro-abortion. And, and then many people who say they're pro-life, this is me just, y'all asked me to come, I'm just going to share. <laughs> this, ain't, this ain't even in my notes. I ain't even going nowhere. This ain't even up here. I'm just talking right now. Right? Don't bring me back, but I, I'm here now, so you got to listen. And then, and then people who say they're pro-life, I don't know if they're really pro-life. Are they pro-birth? How can you be pro-life and pro-capital punishment? Be pro-life and not care about the life after it's born. You might be pro-birth, and some of these pro-lifers ain't nothing but pro-birthers. Care about the birth, but not about the life. Because if you cared about the life, you would be incensed about Sandy Hook. And all the number of shootings that have happened. Anyway, that's just my high horse. I'll get off my high horse and go back to my notes because yet I digress. And so, so, so anyway, um, uh, we, 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 John Diamond talks about this thing he needs to live. And we have to um, 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 live the faith that we say we practice. Amen? And so... And so here in this text, here in this text, um, I believe that Jesus begins to give us this new old thing. He's with his disciples. Here's the background. Jesus is um, coming to the end of his public ministry, three and a half years. He is now facing the cross for the glory of God. It is the upper room experience that takes place over Four chapters in the Gospel of John, chapter 13, 14, 15, and 16. This is upper room experience. He has just had communion with his boys. He had just washed their feet. He had just confronted Judas, and Judas is now leaving the room. And Jesus is in this moment, well, kind of like I was when my girls were getting ready to go off to school. I felt very anxious because as the end of the semester, 
after the senior years were coming, I began to um, wanted to think about all the 18 years of lessons and all that I've taught them. I wanted to remind them what was most important. You know, I would say, now you got to remember that this is important. When, you, when you're no longer under our roof, don't forget this. And, you know, things like always keep your head on a swivel, right? Don't drink anything if, you, if it didn't come already closed. With the, come on, somebody, just kind of the lessons I want to give them. Um, and, and, and I got daughters, and so I said, you know, I, I was a college guy, and I, you know, and he don't love you. No matter how, no matter how convincing he says it, I just want to give my daughters the important things of all the things that I taught you over 18 years. Come on, somebody. My wife gave them lessons about don't wear white pants certain times. And I don't care about the color of your pants. He don't love you. Yet. See, y'all not, I'm just, can we just be real? I'm just, I'm just trying to say, right? <clears throat> Keep it a main thing. To, and now... I think Jesus is in this moment. He's like, I've been with you for three and a half years. I, we've done some stuff. You've seen me raise a dead. You've seen me do this. You've seen me do that. You've seen me feed the 5,000. You, you've seen me do all this amazing. Give sight to the blind. He says, I need to let you know what the most important thing is. You got to get this thing. You got to get this. He says, a new command I give you. Love another. Jesus could not have been a Baptist. Could not have been, because if it was the last sermon that a bachelor preacher said, New Command, I give you tithe. <laughs> my brother and sister. Sorry, my Pentecostal says, Speak in tongues. My brothers and sisters, my good Presbyterians would be, Do things decent <laughs> and in order. Come on, somebody, right? Decent in order. But Jesus, the, the author and finisher of our faith, Jesus, who is our Lord and Savior, Jesus, who's Mary's baby and God's only begotten son, at the pinnacle of his teaching, he says, don't forget, love is still the answer. Legislation is important because it gives us a standard to hold people to. But love is still the answer. Only God's love can transform lives. Even Martin Luther King talked about the importance of legislation. Can't, you can't legislate someone's heart. Hear me. Legislation is important. But that's not going to change the world. What's going to change the world is the who, what, when, where, why, and how's of love. And I just want to spend a few moments talking about this new old thing. The first thing he tells us is, he tells his disciples, he says, what? What? He tells us what we should do. He says that we should love. He says, a new command I give to you, that we should love one another. It's interesting because he says there's a new command, but it's not a new command. It's actually an old command. The Old Testament and Deuteronomy and Leviticus and other places, Exodus, talks about the importance of love. We know that um, he summarizes in Matthew the greatest command is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and your neighbor as yourself. He says it's new. And why would Jesus say a new command I give to you when it's not new? Well, there's two words in the Greek for new. The first word that we may be more familiar with is naos. Naos. That means brand new. That, 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 that's like some of the, like I, 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 came, I pulled up in the parking lot and I saw someone who had a brand new car. It's brand new. It wasn't used. It wasn't, it's, it's brand spanking new. Come on, somebody. It's, <laughs> amen, amen. It, it's, it's kind of like when you buy new underwear, you want to make sure it's brand new. We don't buy underwear from Goodwill. Amen. We, we want underwear that's what? Brand new. Brand new. But, but he didn't use the word um, naos 
in this, naos in this word. He used the word um, kainos in this word, kainos. And kainos means to be refreshed or to be renewed or to be reminded. It says, he says, a new command is not new. He says, I want to remind you what's important. You've seen all kinds of stuff, and you've seen all kinds of wonderful things with me. You've seen me walk on water. You've seen me calm the angry sea storm. You've seen me do some amazing things and the miracles I perform. He says, but I need you to understand the thing that I want to put at the forefront of your mind, the thing that is most important, the thing that never ends, that believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. It's greater than faith. It's greater than hope. He says, love. I need to put that in the very forefront of your mind. He says, you know why he has to? Because love is not natural. Love is not something that we want to do. I always trip oh, off of you, know, you, 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 you young couples, y'all get on my nerves. Y'all say stuff that don't make no sense. You know, y'all say things like, um, you come to the pastor's office, you engage, you, you know, you're like, why are you getting married? I fell in love. You fell in love. <laughs> when I fell in love to just get up and to fall out of love. Amen. In other words, this new command I want to put in the forefront of your mind is not something we do on accident. It's a discipline act. It is a decision that we make. Are y'all with me on that? So, so what he tells us to do, and, and I need you all to understand that, that, did you know that there were over 95 million pictures around the world that are taken each day? And did you know that 33% of those pictures are selfies? One out of three pictures that are taken throughout the world are selfies. And we are selfish. And he says, I need you to refresh and remind that love is not easy. It is not something that's natural. It's something that we have to work with, work at. Are you all with me? Yeah. Then he goes on to tell us who. Who should we? He says, he says, what should we do? He says, we should love. And we should love in the kainos way, and, um, a, a way that is refresh and restore and remind us that it is not an accident. We don't accidentally love folks. We must focus and put effort and discipline ourselves to love. Secondly, he says who we should do it to. He says one another. Stop. He's talking to the 11 because Judas had just left. He says, hey, a new command I give to you that we should love each other. Listen to me. That was a diverse group of disciples. They weren't all from the same place. They didn't all have the same background. And I am so, this is why, y'all think I'm joking. This is why I think New Hope is unique and special. At its core, at its foundation, it wanted to be diverse. It, it turns my stomach. Margo knows this. It turns my stomach when we talk about we're the oldest, Second Baptist, the oldest black church. I don't want to be the oldest black church. I want to be a church that loves anybody that comes my way, whether they black, gold, green, or orange. Now, I will say it is hard to love the green people. They be tripping sometimes. But other than that, <laughs> amen. amen. One, one another. So, who, so, so what? We are to love who? One another. Where? Right where we are. In our own oikos, in our circle of influence. We, we need to start with each other right where we are. Some of us need to start right here in this fellowship hall. There's some of us that sit on this side because we don't like someone on that side. Come on, somebody. There's some of us who want to be on a session and they got they didn't get on the session or not, they're no longer on the session or whatever. Now you're mad because someone was on the session that you thought you should be on the session and you got issue. And I'm telling you that if we are concerned about divisiveness in the world, we got to end the division in the church. Yeah. 
Where do we start? We start right here. This is the honest and goodness truth. I don't know if I ever told you this story before, but when I was at ITC after my first year, I told you I didn't want to be a pastor. I didn't want to be in ministry. I went because I thought I would learn, take a few courses in theology and be a good Sunday school teacher for young people and get a real job and make some real money outside the church. I was being a good Christian. I would go to school, learn how to do little Bible studies for kids, but have a real job so I wouldn't be some jack leg. And, 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 and one of the guys, saw, one of the deans of, of the school saw something in me, so he sent me to St. Louis to do an internship. I did a year-long internship in the heart of St. Louis, and I started a summer program when I got there, and we started off with just five kids, and by the end of the summer, we had nearly 100 kids, and, and, and it was just incredible work that I was doing. It was it's the most powerful work that I'd ever done to that point, and um, there was a little kid. He was about eight years old, maybe seven. He was undersized, scrawny, and every major ruckus we had in that program, he was right in the middle of it. <laughs> this little old undersized little boy, I'm going to tell y'all. Can I tell y'all something? I'm going to tell you something. 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 That little boy was the devil. No, 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 no. Look at me. Look at me. Look at me. He was young Lucifer. I called him Lucifer II. The sequel. That little boy. He was Satan. I don't care. I don't care if you think it's inappropriate. He was Satan. I look Satan in his eyes every morning. And so the pastor, after a few weeks, he pulls me into his office. He's like, how's things going? He said, the ministry is going. I said, man, it's going well. Da, 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 da. We, everything is wonderful. I said, just one little thing. He said, what? I said, um, this is a little boy. His name is Aaron. And he's Satan. And if you would just allow me to kick him out the program. I know Jesus went after the one sheep, but let's call him a dog and let him go. I'm just telling you, that's what I, I, told, I told. And so my pastor said this. He said, this was Cope Brilliant Presbyterian Church on, uh, on the corner of Marcus and Labity in the heart of St. Louis. Reverend William G. Gillespie was the pastor. William G. Gillespie, I forgot y'all good Presbyterians. Y'all might, some of y'all might know him. Um, Reverend Gillespie says, with this deep voice, he says, well, Ivan, he said, we can kick him out. I'm okay with that. Give him two weeks. He said, here's what I want you to do. I want you, for the first 90 seconds that he walks through the door, I want you to meet him. I want you to ask him how his day was. I want you to just shower blessings and words of encouragement. And I want you to give him a hug and then let him go. I want you to do that every day. For two weeks, I look. What you talking about, Willis? You, <laughs> you done lost your mind. I ain't touching Satan. <laughs> Satan, get behind thee. I ain't trying to. And so I did. I did that first day, and I said, "Hey, man, how's it going? What? How, how was your day?" He said, "How was your day?" And just before well, I didn't, I, I, I did about 15 seconds. I couldn't take no more. I just gave the little boy a hug. He stood like a bull. The next day, I got to about 25 seconds. I gave him a hug, and he was like a boy. By day four, he stopped resisting and let me hug him. We got to about 45 seconds. By the middle of the second week, we were having five-minute conversations, and people were like, come on, we got to go. I'm like, okay. He became one of the most outstanding young men in the program. He goes off, and because Reverend Gillespie, you don't know what he deals with when he leaves here. A boy that young, that angry, has to deal with stuff you can't even imagine. Yeah. After two weeks, he became a good friend. I followed him for years. He goes off and graduates with an associate's degree. Didn't go off to get a four-year degree, but he played college, uh, football. Um, and he had a great job and a great family, doing wonderful in life. And it all started because someone forced me to love right where I am. Who? Who? 
who, one another, what, love, where, right where you are. When, when we're facing our darkest hour, Jesus is getting ready to be, uh, he's already been betrayed, he's getting ready to be um, denied, he's getting ready to have a, a, tri uh, a kangaroo court trial, he's getting ready to take on the pain and the suffering of this world for our benefit, sins that were not his, a penalty that was not his. He was getting ready to be beaten and crucified beyond recognition. He was getting ready to go into the very gates of hell for our benefit. So when, in your darkest hour, love means nothing if you can only express it when things are good. When in our darkest hour, I don't know if you all remember years ago, uh, Desmond Tutu in one of his books, he talked about the um, apartheid trials. And as they went back to prosecute those who had, who, who had violated the wars, uh, the uh, crimes of war, one particular man who was on trial was sentenced, um, was, was found guilty of murder and all kinds of other things. And, and as they began to sentence, they allowed people who were victimized by his his, um, his, um, his crimes to come forward. And this one woman who was a devout Christian, she came and she shared, she said, be, she said, I don't want you to sentence him to prison. She said, I want you to sentence him to come to my house every day. He killed my husband. And then 15 years later, he came back and killed my son. I only had one child. I only had one husband. Everything I've loved, he killed but I still have my husband's clothes and my son's clothes in my house. And I want you to sentence him to come to my house and have him put on my son's and my husband's clothes and allow me to make him lunch and dinner every day. Allow me to give him the love that he took from me. He broke my heart. I want to break his heart with the love of God. Love means nothing if you can't love in your darkest hour. When it hurts the most, when you're most desperate. Father, forgive them. For they know not what they do. Let me pause parenthetically for a moment. I appreciate, um, where is the professor? Where is she? Professor, I appreciate your words. As a matter of fact, I would like to have some of those words and just, um, but as I um, was brutally attacked and um, um, uh, I, don't know, it was, I was, God wanted to kill me um, and tried. Uh, there's a whole bunch of folks you want to kill, but you don't try. He tried. And I remember the very moment when I got away and was in ICU, um, one of the nurses, this is the honest to God truth story, one of the nurses who was looking at all my injuries and, and was um, um, seeing how very close to serious one stab wound was just about an inch from my spine, another was less than a millimeter from my brain, and, um, and then there was no serious, serious long-term eye damage, though my eye is still not fully recovered, but it's gonna take time, and I still have numbness in my face and my back from the five stab wounds is still tight, I can feel it, and I haven't gotten all my wind back, but I'm laying in ICU just 10 or 12 hours after the incident, and he's looking at all my stuff, and he says to me, you got to be pissed off, man. He doesn't know I'm a pastor. He don't know anything about me. All he knows is I'm a brother who might be able to fight a little bit. Amen. I said, I'm not pissed. He said, but look what happened to you, man. He said, I've been talking to you for the last several hours. You seem like a cool guy. Why would anybody do this to you? And I said, why would Why not me? He said, I know you want to get that guy. I said, no. I said, I don't, for someone to attack me that don't know me to this level, I don't know what that man has been through. I don't know what's in his heart. I forgive him, and I'm moving on. And, and I'm not saying that to get hand claps, but hate is too big a burden to bear. And I refuse, I refuse, hear me, I refuse to be bound by hate. 
and I refuse even though it hurts and even though it is not over and I gotta face this guy and try at some point when they find that he's gonna be sane enough to stand trial. And I don't know how brave I'll be when that day comes. But what I am committed to is not being another person who's gonna bring more division and hate because of what happened to me. What, love, who, one another, where, right where we are, when, in our darkest hour, how? He says, love is our love. How did he love? Sacrificially, sacrificially unconditionally, unending, and without promise of reciprocation. My command, is this, love each other as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, to lay his life down for his friend. That's how Christ loved, and that's how he's telling us to love. There are no conditions. We love unconditionally, amen? amen. And lastly, why? Why love? Well, it tells us, by this, everyone would know we are his disciples. Love is the hallmark. Love is the stamp. Love is the poster, the billboard that tells the world that we are God's disciple. No one has ever seen God, but if we love one another, God lives in us and his love is made complete in us. In other words, when we love, we show people God. God is saying in this, we're gonna be judged by our ability to love, the who, what, when, where, why, and how. Love makes God visible. Little children, love one another because love is enough. What the world needs now is love, sweet love. We don't need another politician. We don't need another party. We don't need another nothing. All we need is more love. And what we need are Christians who believe in God is to love. And I don't want to make any more disciples of hate. I want to make disciples of love. I'm going to close with this story that's very painful but very real. And I'll, and I'll close with this. This is a true story. Um, I'm the only pastor in my family of the five of us, um, and, and I have a unique, I don't have a better relationship, but I have a unique relationship with my mom. My mom is, has full-blown Alzheimer's. She's, she sometimes knows, I'm, knows who I am, and most of the time she doesn't, and that's fine. But about, I don't know, about 15 years ago, when she was in her right mind, and um, she, um, one of my best friends is a Jewish uh, guy who I went to middle school with, and we're just very, very tight. And, um, and I was talking to her about him, and she says, I'm so glad that you all have friends of all backgrounds and all religious beliefs and all this diversity. And I was like, yeah, Ma, well, you sent us to all these schools. You didn't want us to be in the hood. You wanted us to, and we got bus 45 minutes here, an hour here, and da, da, da. you let us be a part of all this stuff. She said, let me tell you why I did that. This messed me up. She said, because I grew up in the Jim Crow South, and I hated white people. And she said, and I moved here to California and I still hated white people. And I worked with white people and I hated them there. And she said, and this hate was consuming me and I realized that I did not want to pass that same hate to you all. So I sent you to places where you could learn to love people who were different so you didn't have the hate that I had. Oh, wow. I said, mom, you're one of the most loving people I know. She said, how many white friends do I have? I said, uh. <laughs> well, you got, you like a TV show that got a white person on there. <laughs> My mother said, I don't want to pass the hate on to you all. And I hate that I still hate. I'm stopping there. 
I don't want to pass no more hate on. I don't want to hate people who vote different from me. I don't want to hate people who love different from me. I want to hate people who are vaccinated different from me. I don't want to pass on hate to my children because what the world needs now is not hate, more hate. But Jesus said, I need to refresh and remind us that the thing that's most important, the thing that matters most, the thing that we need to put at the forefront of our minds is that we are apostles of love. And by that love, people will know that we are his. Let's pray. God, I thank you so much for this word. I pray that it landed on good soil. God, I ask that you forgive us for our language that causes more division and hatred. Forgive us for not forgiving because we are hurting. Forgive us for not starting right where we are with the folks who are right in our own circle of influence. And God, would you give us a vision greater than our pain that we can love in spite of how dark the hour is. And God, I pray that we here at New Hope, here in Second Baptist, here in Orange County, begin to bond together with cords that cannot be broken, that we can make a difference in this world by first loving like Christ love us. May we be known for our loving positions and not our political positions. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Come on, let's give the Lord a hand clap of praise. just going to take a liberty. I want you to extend your hands to Reverend Pitts as I lead us in a time of prayer for him. Gracious and loving God, God who has poured out your spirit in many ways upon this dear man. God, you know the roads he has traveled you know the things he has come through, the things he has seen. God, you know how far his heart has gone to love people, to be God's love for little Lucifers. And God, we ask that you would restore him to full health. God, we ask that you would restore sight to his eye, movement to all of his body, God, that you would remove the, the stiffness, the tightness in his back. And more than that, God, that you would go before him in these days. That his testimony would be a testimony of love. God, we thank you for this brother who is part of our family here. And that Second Baptist and, and New Hope are one body called to love for this time, in this place, for this season. So God, we thank you for, for Ivan Pitts, for his life, for his testimony, and for all that you are going to be doing in and through him in the days ahead. We ask this all in your precious and mighty name. Amen. We're going to do this prayer time just a little differently. I think this whole service is going to be done a little differently. Praise God. So I have uh, given out 21 slips of paper representing the 21 people who were massacred on Tuesday. Last week, I read the names of those who were murdered in Buffalo and uh, 
uh, Dr. Chang at the uh, Irvine Taiwanese Presbyterian Church, one of our churches. I knew I couldn't get through 21 names, especially with 19 of them being 10 or 11 years old, one even nine-year-old. And the fact that one of the teacher's husbands died of a heart attack afterwards. God, we feel that. And so I invite those 21 people to stand up. What I've done is I've printed out their name with the picture of that person, and I've asked them that as we open this time of prayers to the people, that they would speak out their names, hopefully one at a time, but you know, this is organic, and that we would, we would register that in our own souls and we would pray for each one of those 21 people, their families, their community, 16,000 people in Uvalde. How does a community get over this? Well, we're going to love. We're going to do, I'm sure, some actions beyond this. Whether it's writing letters, whether it's sending money, we will do something because that's this church. But in this moment, in our pain, even as Patina said it better than I could, let us pray for the 21 victims of that mass murder. Someone just start and read the name. Yes, Jesus. Now, if I could invite the rest of you to stand up and invite you in the same spirit to speak out the names of those people who are on your hearts, the situations, the communities that you want us to surround those prayers that you have brought in. So this is the time for the community prayers of the people. Pastor Janetta. Sandra Jones. Melvin. Bettina. Jeannie. Don and Marionette. Thank you. Shelby. Alan. God, we come together. We come together hearing the word of God that we are to love one another. And God, we fail. We are so short of coming to that place. But God, but God, you are the one who can help us love the unlovely, to love the people who look 
differently than we do, who believe differently, who act differently, who eat different foods, who dress differently, sound different. But God, you are the one who can break down those barriers. And we pray for that, God, that you would, you would bring us to our knees to love those who are not like us. And I end with a prayer that the Reverend Dr. Diane Moffitt, who is the President and Executive Director of our Presbyterian Mission Agency. This is her prayer that she posted after the massacre this week. We are weary. We are broken, we're heartbroken over the loss of more lives. Children dying before they had a chance to live. Hopes and dreams cut off and smashed to pieces by gunfire and bullets. We are tired of excuses. We are tired of cultivating a culture of violence, which essentially kicks people and blames them for limping. We are tired of the unwillingness to act. We are tired of those in power who work to prevent any real change. And those who say that gun violence can't be reduced. Our hope and strength needs renewal to continue to fight for justice and fight for safe places for our children, for your people. Send the power of your Holy Spirit, turn our sadness into compassion, turn our tiredness into advocacy. Use us, work through us, and if necessary, in spite of us, to mend the brokenness and bring your realm of peace on earth. Amen. Like every week, anybody who wants to come up after service, uh, I will anoint you for what it is that you want anointing for. It's been a long time since we had to get tissues out in church. But we know that these are combined tears, those of sorrow, but those of also victory and joy. And we honor each other when we honor the tears. As you all know, I stand before you here to do my weekly announcements, but, or in addition to the announcements, want to express to this congregation just how important each of you are and that you matter. You really do matter. And the love that you give matters and how we leave here and can boldly say we go to New Hope Presbyterian Church you need to come join us and that's what we're looking for for next week because as you know we have been preed up to praise God and boy are we gonna praise him next week in our new sanctuary So Pentecost, the wind and the fire, will be here waiting for you in our new sanctuary next Saturday at 5 p.m., June 4th. Please make sure you have the opportunity, if you can, to print out that flyer and share it with someone. We want to be able to have not just the community, but those of us that want to make sure that we continue our outreach just amongst our family and our friends, that we invite them out for the wind and the fire. Because Pentecost is coming, 
to New Hope Presbyterian Church. We walk into a new era, into a new building, into a newness, into a rebirth, into a renewing of being reborn into what God has called us into for this time and place here in Anaheim, California, in the United States and in this world. And then after that celebration, we want you to join us again for the Gospel Voices of OC. Come and support these children, these other choirs that are coming out for Juneteenth to come together as a sign of love for one another and a sign of acknowledgement for what Juneteenth stands for. And that event is going to be on Sunday at 4 p.m. So please, your tickets are on sale now. You can go to the Arts and Learning Conservatory website, or you can contact the church office for more information about tickets. So as you all know, we're getting ready to also have our first New Hope inaugural health fair. See, New Hope cares about your health, too. And in honor of that, we have one of our most amazing. These group of young people are amazing. They are med students from UCI that want to come out and partner with us. And they really have come out and just kind of showed up and showed out. You have. Janine, you must admit you have. And so, Janine Verrett, if you would please stand. Janine Verrett and her colleagues, her fellow physicians, soon to be physicians, are coming out to support us in this healthcare event. So, please welcome Janine to the stage. So thank you so much for having me. I'm a little shy, but we are so, so excited to partner with New Hope Presbyterian Church on this health fair. It is so, so important. I actually grew up in Santa Ana, which is not far from here. And I remember being a little girl, walking home or driving somewhere, and how many people you see struggling, working hard, just certain circumstances where they can't care for themselves, my family included. And so this is why this health fair is so important to me and my colleagues to bring health equity to our community. It's so, so important and we're so happy. We're gonna have so many doctors, dentists, nurses here to help the community. So please spread the word. Everyone deserves health care. Everyone deserves the health that they need. So please spread the word and we have flyers. At the end of the day, just as Pastor Pitts reminded us, we just all need love. We need to give it, we need to receive it, and what better way for you to show your love for New Hope Presbyterian Church than in your giving. I'm gonna keep that one on, on the paper. Yeah. <laughs> That's a good one. <laughs> And so I'll say it again. There is no better way to show your love for New Hope Presbyterian Church than other in your giving. Our time, our treasures, our tithes, our gifts. And I get to stand here and thank God because I get to give out of my overflow. And I would have never thought, one, that it would have taken me this long. 
a little hard-headed, Lord, I know. But there's something that happens for me now when I pay my tithes and then I give my offering knowing that it's not going to impact anything else that I need to do. And because of that love, God has been able to have me bless even others. And it is a privilege to give. Some people think because it came out of the Old Testament, it was a commandment. No, it was a privilege then too. Because what God requires for what he gives is very, very small. And we should always be ready and willing to give him what he requires, which is our praise, our worship, and our giving, and our love. So as you proceed out after Pastor Ivan Pitts gives the benediction, you can leave your offering with the ushers. They will be at the doors as you go. If you did not bring it with you, you can have the opportunity to pay online. You have the opportunity to mail it in. And you also have the opportunity to call Anita and tell her you're going to bring it by. So we have made sure you have no excuse not to give. And we thank you for your gift because it allows God to continue to bless us through other grants and services, but it also makes sure that we get to come into our new space next week, knowing that that's our space forever. And we should be praising God for that.